This is a New York Glitch production. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Heather Ashley, and welcome to another episode of Women of Her Story, a podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. It's Tuesday, so give a big welcome to Huckleberry Finn from the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Howdy, howdy. Well, how you doing there, Heather? <laughs> oh, we're Southern today. <laughs> no, I was just trying something different. <laughs> but that is my name, though. That's that's my name. We got the Huckleberry. Only, yeah, the accent's the only thing that's changing. Um, So, before we get into the episode, I need to share a trigger warning with you all. Today we're going to be talking about the life of Dr. Gisela Pearl. She was a Jewish prisoner at Auschwitz. So we're going to be talking about violence toward women and children as well as rape and abortion. So if you find these topics to be too much to listen to right now, then maybe this episode isn't the one for you and that's totally fine. Just come on back Friday for the next episode and uh, be safe. So... Are we ready to get into it? You know, I don't know if anyone's truly ready for these topics, but I, I, yeah, let's do it. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing her story. Yeah. Here we go. This one is heavy, so maybe grab your favorite teddy bear or blanket, snuggle up, get a glass of wine or a carafe, you know, whatever. Gisela Pearl was born on December 10th, 1907 in an area of Hungary that is now Romania. Gisela was a bright young woman who showed promise at an early age. When she was 16, she was the only woman and the only Jewish person to graduate from her secondary school top of class. Wow, okay. Yeah. So she's nice. a smart cookie. Yeah. Gisela knew she wanted to go to medical school, and she knew she had some convincing to do. Her father, a traditional Jewish man, wasn't on board with her professional aspirations, at least not at first. He expressed that he didn't want her to lose her faith and leave Judaism. Not one to give up, Gisela pressed the issue for months and returned to her father holding a prayer book. She recalls saying to her father, I swear on this book that wherever life will take me under whatever circumstance, I shall always remain a good, true Jew. And he gave in. Well, that's nice of him. I mean, she was she wasn't saying that she was going to, you know, just completely, you know, change her religion. Mm-hmm. She just wanted to go to med school I, at an early age, which yeah. you know, good on for her. I, I feel like I, I, I think have a stomach for that. Yeah, even I, now, I think he was worried about her um, leaving her faith for science because that's a misconception, you know, oh, sure. that people of science can't be people of faith and vice versa. Right. So I think that was his primary concern, but because of who she was as a person, she was able to say, "Listen, that's not." S- That's not the case here. I have hopes and dreams. Yeah. So years later, after she was paid by her first patients, she went out and bought her father a prayer book and had his name engraved in it. Oh. Yeah, as a nice little callback to their... That's that's nice of her. Yeah. In 1944, Dr. Pearl was working as a successful gynecologist. She She married a surgeon, Dr. Krauss, and together they had a son and then a daughter. They were living in a Jewish ghetto with her family in Hungary, again, modern-day Romania. In March of that same year, Dr. Pearl, her husband, son, parents, and extended family were packed up and sent to Auschwitz. They were immediately separated. You might be wondering where her daughter was. She had previously been hidden with a non-Jewish family right before the war broke out because they knew that things were about to go down thank goodness for that Mm -hmm. that's scary yeah that's sad so sad upon arrival dr pearl was given direct orders from the monster himself dr joseph mengele aka dr death dr pearl remembers that her first duties were pretty standard she says quote i had to bandage bloody heads treat broken ribs and clean wounds (sighs) Her fellow prisoners were suffering from diseases wrought by torture, starvation, filth, lice, and rats. She was told to encourage inmates to donate blood for use by the German army, 
and Dr. Pearl recalled having to perform operations on young women's breasts that had been whipped and had become infected with no medicine and only a knife as her instrument. Good grief. I know. I gave, I warned you guys. <laughs> I warned you. Yeah. Not too long into her imprisonment, she was given new orders from Dr. Death. Dr. Pearl was told to inform him of any pregnant women in the camp. He claimed that they would be sent to a different camp to get proper treatment. She had already seen the horrors of the Nazis, but some women who overheard the orders began to approach him on their own. She said, quote, women began to run directly to him, telling him, I am pregnant. In a New York Times interview, she recalled that these women were taken to the research block to be used as guinea pigs. And then the two lives would be thrown into the crematorium. Oh, man. I know. They, were, they didn't even know what they were volunteering no, for. No, because they hadn't been there long enough to know, and they hadn't truly seen what was happening. They thought, oh, I'm going to be taken care of because yeah. I'm pregnant. They want my, They're you know, gonna, they I'm want gonna us to be. because mm -hmm. I have a kid, but that's no. the furthest thing. Yeah. Dr. Death famously experimented on twins and as well as pregnant women. He would perform vivisections with no anesthetics. That's experimentation, like autopsy-like surgeries performed mm -hmm. on the living, waking humans. Man. Mm -hmm. That's like some American horror story type of... Yeah. And, and especially with Ugh. the pregnant women, he would do this at like varying degrees of their pregnancy so that he could see how the baby was developing Study, inside quote unquote science but, yeah. yeah like mm -hmm. that's ridiculous yeah. monsters dr gisela pearl decided then and there that there would never be another pregnant woman at auschwitz she had no medicine no medical instruments and she was unprepared for the horrors that would come her way Knowing that if she delivered the babies, Nazis would hear their cries and then would they would undoubtedly come to the barracks and kill the infant, mother, and surrounding women in the barracks. If she was to turn the pregnant women in, they and the delivered infant would die after suffering tremendously. It was a lose, 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 no matter what. Against her teaching and the social code of the day, Dr. Pearl had no choice but to begin performing rudimentary abortions in the barracks. I know. I know. Deep breaths. That's... I know. I'm, I'm having to talk fast because if I, if I talk any slower, I'm going to cry. So <laughs> in, a New York, in, in a New York Times interview, she said that, quote, hundreds of times I had premature deliveries. No one will ever know what it meant to me to destroy those babies. But if I had not done it, both mother and child would have been cruelly murdered. She put her her primary mission in the mothers. Right. That's where she put where life was. It was either... Both of them die. Or, or yeah, or we, we save one. Yeah. Doctor, that's, yeah, I that know. sucks to have to choose. That no one should ever have to choose, especially no. in her circumstance. But. I know. Doctor Pearl described a particularly sadistic Nazi woman by the name of Irma, and she's the worst. I hate her. Oh my god, Irma. Um, you know, I said that just now off the cuff, and the very next note in my script was Irma was a piece of work, and I hate her. <laughs> so <laughs> the feeling is changed. there. <laughs> She was a 19-year-old warden in Auschwitz. That's... She grew up in the Nazi youth organization. According to Dr. Pearl, Irma would closely observe all of the procedures and derived obvious pleasure from the suffering of those around her, a true sadist. She helped paint a picture of Irma by saying, quote, her face was clear and angelic and her blue eyes the gayest and most innocent eyes one can imagine. So she's just this picture-perfect person who is who a has torture. no who has no monster. emotions she's just an absolute monster irma was later put on trial and executed for her horrific war crimes so good news number one of the story yeah so some women arrived to the camp pregnant while others became pregnant while imprisoned sexual exchanges and rape were a common occurrence in auschwitz and other concentration camps Women's bodies and sexuality were simply objects to SS officers and, unfortunately, to fellow male prisoners as well. 
They felt like they had the right to possess and use the women as they pleased. There were even special barracks that the SS used to rape and molest women. This complicated things as there were decrees against engaging in sexual acts with Jewish women. <laughs> there was inner conflict for, for SS officers, which then leads to escalating violence towards women, and the women were blamed for seducing the officers. They were conflicted by their own moral code and then took it out on the women yes. for, like, yes. baiting them to, yes. like, disobey their own sort of yes. compass. Um, yeah. Okay, these yeah. were awful men. I don't yeah. think that had to be argued yeah. or said, nope. but there's Terrible. definitely a special place in hell for yes. those yes. people. One yeah. survivor said, quote, I was with my mother and we saw these women in striped uniforms with blonde hair, some longer than others, and I remember asking my mother why they were allowed to have hair while we weren't. My mother said to me, because this was how the SS liked them. I never knew what that meant at that time. So the, I didn't know that they would do that with some of the women. They would bleach their hair and let them grow it long because they favored those particular prisoners as um They fancied objects. them more yeah. and let them mm -hmm. grow their hair out. That's gross. Mm -hmm. That's their gross yeah. people. Most acts weren't consensual, but sometimes sex was used as a commodity in exchange for food and goods. Dr. Pearl received a pair of men's shoes that were far too big for her when she arrived at the camp. She needed a piece of string to tighten them and found out about a male prisoner who had string. She brought her bread ration as an exchange for the string, but he wasn't interested in the bread. He looked her up and down and decided that her body had to be the payment. Disgusted and disheartened, Dr. Pearl knew that she needed the shoes to survive. She needed the shoes to walk back and forth to work because they're forcing her to be a doctor without any instruments. And she knew that it was a matter of life and death. Women used what they had. They felt shame, embarrassment, and then this also meant that they were risking life-threatening pregnancies. Man, that's disgusting i know i hate it i keep calling them people but they're yeah, definitely animals they're yeah. definitely like a lower subsection of yeah. of in living form under <laughs> people yeah. like living forms yeah. like like single cell mm -hmm. organisms mm -hmm. anyway if dr pearl heard of a pregnancy she would explain to the mothers the situation if the ss knew she and the unborn child would be dead she performed abortions and terminated pregnancies in the middle of the night with her bare hands. No tools, anesthetics, bandages, or antibiotics. On the dirty floors and bunk beds. Sometimes women would get to the final stages of pregnancy unnoticed. They were so malnourished that the women would hardly even show at all. So they could be nine months pregnant and there would be nothing there because that's how malnourished they are. They are. <laughs> So Dr. Pearl would perform these births, and when requested, she would take the breath from the newborns to save the women. That's, no one should have to. I know. She shouldn't have to. I know. Dr. Pearl envisioned that these women would have children with their loved ones after the war. She wanted them to be able to raise their families outside of the concentration camps. In her bio autobiography, I Was a Doctor in Auschwitz, Dr. Pearl says, quote, I treated patients with my voice, telling them beautiful stories, telling them that one day we would have birthdays again, that one day we would sing again. Ugh, I have to breathe for a second. I'm so... Okay. She rationalized that in Auschwitz and concentration camps, the role of the Jewish doctor was not to heal, but to hasten death. Towards the end of the war, she saw rare cases of babies being born in camps and surviving, mostly because the Germans were preoccupied with the Allies closing in at this point. The Russian troops were approaching in 1945, and the Germans began to shut down gas chambers and concentration camps. Dr. Pearl was moved to a camp near Hamburg and then was transferred again two months later to bergen belsen the latter she described as, quote, the supreme fulfillment of German sadism and bestiality. When the war was finally over and the camps liberated, Dr. Pearl wandered the streets searching and searching and searching for her family. She saved countless lives in Auschwitz, but she was the sole survivor of her family. 
Her teenage son died in a gas chamber, and her husband was beaten to death shortly before the camp was liberated. The grief and guilt proved to be too much, and in 1947, she attempted suicide by poison. This attempt was thankfully unsuccessful, and she was sent to a convent in France to recuperate. Later that same year, Dr. Pearl came to the United States on a temporary visa to speak to doctors and professionals as an ambassador of the six million killed in the Holocaust. Well, great. Mm -hmm. I'm glad she's able to be the voice of those who didn't have one, Mm -hmm. who couldn't have one. She was sponsored by the Hungarian Jewish Appeal and the United Jewish Appeal. While on the lecture circuit, Eleanor Roosevelt invited her to lunch. Dr. Pearl initially declined, saying she couldn't because she was kosher and it would be trouble. Eleanor insisted and provided her with a kosher lunch. Dr. Pearl told the New York Times that it was Eleanor who encouraged her to start practicing again. She said that Eleanor told her, stop torturing yourself. Become a doctor again. Meanwhile, the INS interrogated her on the suspicion that she assisted the Nazi doctors of Auschwitz in carrying out human rights abuses. Oh, man. Now, to be fair, I I do sort of understand the thought process because they were going through all that stuff by... uh, They were um, prosecuting all of these... War or criminals. Yeah, and doctors. And she was technically listed as a doctor. Sure. But... I think it was actually the testimony of her inmates that of her fellow inmates that saved her. I'm sure. I mean, I don't know if she was really. Some people are just. Some people might have like you know, uh, you know, even if they have a good moral compass, it's like it's their life or you know. Oh, she didn't have a choice. She was a prisoner. Right. So it's she wasn't like, like part of the Nazis. She was a prisoner, and they were like, here, um, here's a knife. You can take care of women stuff. And then she just completely, you know, went went 360 and started saving, you know, mm-hmm. tried to save every woman she could mm-hmm. and just, you know, did all these good things to help, mm-hmm. you know, ease the pain of the people there. So mm-hmm. one of the other, uh, one of the, one of her fellow inmates said, without Dr. Pearl's medical knowledge and willingness to risk her life by helping us, it would be impossible to know what would have happened to me and to many other female prisoners. In 1948, President Truman signed a bill allowing Dr. Pearl to stay in the United States. And three years later, at the age of 44, she was granted U.S. citizenship. Nice. Dr. Pearl moved to New York City. Shout out. Yeah. NYC, <laughs> Big Apple. And started working at Mount Sinai Hospital, specializing in infertility. Oh. She was the sole author or co-author of nine papers on vaginal infection published between 1955 and 1972. I know, she's amazing. Eventually, she opened up her own practice on Park Avenue. It was her sole mission to bring life into the world. She said, I was the poorest doctor on Park Avenue, but I had the greatest practice All of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen were my patients. She was in practice for 43 years and delivered approximately 3,000 healthy babies. Before I get to the... Okay, this next part's so nice. Okay. Dr. Pearl recounted in her autobiography that every time she entered the delivery room, she would pray, God, you owe me a life. A living baby. That's... Ugh. (laughs) So... I'm glad she. Re- I'm glad she went back to the medical field and you know. know started helping people out like that I again. Know. In 1979, she moved to Israel to be with her daughter Gabriella Kraus Blattman and grandson. It wasn't until later that she learned that her daughter had in fact survived. <sighs> Are you about to tell me how she survived? No, well, she was stowed away with a non-Jewish family. Okay, and then she just kind of then grew she w- up yeah, and she was, like, she, she was she was never was found unharmed out. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, okay, that's really and, nice. Though. And yeah, man, that's that's really sad and though she that had she had a baby. Like Ugh. all that time, how much time it was it in between? It wasn't that long, but it was long enough. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine going like being split up by your, you know, being split up with your kid. Going through this whole tumultuous, you know, time, and then and thinking reuniting you've lost years everyone. later after having yeah. almost attempted suicide, it's like mm-hmm. her, everything was supposed to turn around yeah. for her. That's what that means. There was another reason to move to Israel, and it was to fill a promise that she had made. She said, "Quote: After four days in the cattle car that took us to Auschwitz, suddenly the SS officers opened the door, and prisoners in striped pajamas threw us out. 
my father and my husband both embraced me saying, we will meet again someday in Jerusalem. Her autobiography, I Was a Doctor in Auschwitz, was one of the earliest and only books to openly discuss the sexual violence experienced during the Shoah. And the Shoah is another term for the Holocaust. I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people might not know that. There is a film, Out of Ashes, that is based on her life, starring Christine Lady. And good news, good news is Dr. Gisela Pearl passed of natural causes on December 16th, 1988. Wow. Yes, she lived a nice long life. And she says, It is worthwhile to live. God rewarded me. He rewards me even more now. So forgive me while I weep. Oh my God. I had to speak. This episode could have been longer, but I could not say any of this story slowly because I was on the brink of dying that whole time. <sighs> I, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that there aren't enough um, like books for us to, or like, you know, accounts to hear yeah. more about um, the uh, specifically what, Women went through. Yeah. Women and children went through. It's, I mean, of course, it's like we can only, you know, based on who, you know, the um, survivors' accounts, mm-hmm. there only, there's only sure. so much information we have to go off of. But, uh, you know, she I wrote, guess unfortunate she wrote well. her autobiography like two or three years after everything happened. She, she got right on it. She was like, she was not going to wait another any moment of time to get this story out to say this is what happened and this is we have to do everything that we can to not be in this position again and i uh i think if she had waited any longer to tell that story the impact of of it wouldn't have been as as um i also think people might have doubted her more been like maybe you're making up these facts and exaggerating people still doubt it people don't even want to acknowledge they want to like you know like they want to disbelieve that yeah so i think you know the or the quicker she got that story out the easier they were able to capitalize on and be like these were horrendous people they have to be spread this word yeah their crimes have to be accounted for. i think that's a primary reason why they brought her to the states to do this like circuit talk of yeah like, just to share this is my this. account of what happened mm-hmm. this and was she, real yeah. mm-hmm. if whoever whoever doesn't think that this might have happened or mm-hmm. like you know whoever wants first-hand account of like scientific evidence that like they were doing <laughs> this then and the third yeah and i was I there had to i do was doing this. it and i chose not to and mm-hmm. i helped all these other prisoners so um mm-hmm. yeah good that she got that story yeah. out as quick as possible yeah. sad though yeah, that really she was you know in that situation Ugh, horrific and thank you all so much for sticking through this one. I know it was tough, but it's something that I believe we have to talk about. We run the risk of repeating history every single day, and when we shy away from the horrors of the past, we're simply doomed. If you see injustice, speak out. If you're afraid to speak, then write. If you're afraid to write, then donate. No money to donate, then sign petitions. We hold more power than we realize. Humans can be monsters, but we can also be givers of life and love. Dr. Pearl was faced with decisions that are unfathomable, but she knew it was her duty to protect her fellow humans at the risk of her own life. And then she shared her story with anyone who would listen to make sure that this didn't happen again. We have the gift of knowing, you yes, know. Yes, we have the gift of We have of the knowing. foresight now, like, to prevent certain things. Mm-hmm. and. We can see certain things on the horizon and it's, it is, like you said, it's very, it's, it's within our reach to be able to make that change. We have power to change things. We have power to act. And, um, I think Dr. Pearl's a really unique example of acting in a way that is within her circumstances. We all have way more, I mean, she literally changed people's lives in Auschwitz. You know what I mean? Like, that's, she did what she could to make sure that lives could continue and be safe. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that was a deep one. (laughs) Thank you for the heads up. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. If you, yeah, yeah. So we're going to shift gears now. If you don't mind giving us a little five star 
uh, rating and a review so that we can spread stories just like this one to as many ears as possible. You can follow us on Instagram at Women of Her Story Podcast. You can also send us an email to Women of Her Story Podcast at gmail.com. Come back this Friday for an interview with Maria Bentley. She is the creator and co-owner of Studio 1208 over there in the UK. It's a really good interview. I will tell you guys, it's a long one, but it's so good. We talk about um, a reality show that she was on. We talk about some really amazing projects she's been able to work on. So be sure you tune in for that one. I definitely will. Yeah. I will be tuning in. It's so good. It's long, but it's good. Like, turn it on when you're cleaning or cooking or something. It's fine. Yeah. Or jogging. Whatever. Yeah. I don't know what you do with your life. Yeah. But all, all, the, all, all the same. <laughs> all the same. Tune in. Listen, please. Tune and in. Thank you. And until Friday, be safe, stay healthy, and show the world what you're made of. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs>